Hello, this is Jim McKeith. Welcome to Advanced XML with Oxygen, the compiler that powers Embarcadero Prism. This is the agenda, what I'm going to cover with you in this session. The namespaces and schemas is kind of combined together. The validation comes next, and that's actually going to build on uh, schemas. And then, of course, serialization and deserialization builds on schemas as well. Then we'll look at, take a look at XPath, which is a really cool querying technology, and of course, link to XML. The times you see on the right are, if you're watching this later in the replays, you want to jump straight to those times just to watch that section, that's the time index to go to that. Since namespaces and schemas are tied together, you have to watch the whole thing to get it. But anyway, should be good. So let's jump into demos. The good news is this session is pretty much entirely demos, so I hope you like looking at code and seeing things run. So I know this is advanced XML, but let's start with something really simple here just to make sure we're all on the same page. It'll be quick and hopefully painless. Make an XML file here. Chances are you've seen this. This is the default XML header. Specifies we're using UTF-8 encoding, which you can use something else if you want to, but that's what most everything uses. So you'll notice I have those squiggly lines here. That means I do not have a root node. See, it says right there, must have a root level element. An element is a node or a tag. So we're just gonna have one here called root. Okay, now it automatically created a closed tag for this root element or a closed element. And it does that in order to maintain well-formedness of the XML file. So if you have an XML tag that's not closed, so I'll give this a different name, root one. Now it says, whoa, Tag was not closed, expecting any tag of root one, okay? So that is, if the tags aren't balanced or some other things like that, then it's a not, it's not a well-formed XML document, okay? So you have tag and then the tag can have child tags. So you can have child like this, and that's automatically closed, or you can go child like this and it'll be closed. Now a, An element can have attributes, and those attributes can be named whatever, and attributes have values. Value. Or values, I guess. And values are always enclosed in quotes, even if they're numeric. Okay, simple XML. There you go. That's XML. You know how to do it. You can keep nesting these however much you want to, name it whatever you want to, attributes can be whatever you want to, etc. XML is typically is case sensitive. If you were writing your own interpreter, you could not do that, but all the interpreters out there are going to be case sensitive. So now this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to add a default namespace. Now a namespace, well actually, let's start with a regular namespace. No, namespace. So this means I'm defining a namespace, and then you give it a, a name for that, a prefix. So we're going to say code rage. And then... This is a list of namespaces that Visual Studio recognizes, but I'm going to make up my own here. HTTP the code rage.com slash namespace. Now, the thing about this is this is a URI or commonly referred to as a URL, but it's not referring to a specific page. If you go to that, probably will give you a 404 or something else, but there's no document at that location to retrieve. Okay. What this is doing is it's creating a URI to identify a namespace. So this right here is essentially a GUID, okay? It's a globally unique identifier. You, sh you should use a domain name that you, can you own, that you control, and that's a way of creating a unique identifier. So if you own the domain name, the code rage, which I don't in this case, but if you own that name, then no one else is going to create a namespace containing that URL. So then you can do whatever you want to out here and create this unique identifier. Okay, so what I've done is I've created a namespace called Code Rage. And what that allows me to do is this namespace allows me to say this child is in the namespace Code Rage. Okay, so that means that this is a different child node than this child node. 
Okay, and that becomes more significant when you get into validation. So we have another namespace. Space. We'll call it uh, McKees. And we'll put it at HTTP. Namespace. Okay, so now I have a second namespace stored there, or right, defined there. And so now I can have this one. McKeith child. Okay. So then your schema. Oh. Because there we go. That has to be closed. So because that be balanced, this is no longer a regular child, this is a McKeith child. In validation now is I can have different requirements for this child versus this child. So this child's defined as a different type of child than this is. So this is a human child, while this is a maybe a, a session child or a specific conference because it's a child of code rage. Okay. So kind of uh, made up scenario here, but you could have uh, different scenarios where you have different tags have need to have different names or the same name tag needs to have different meaning under different situations. And so that's what namespaces allow you to do. Now, like I said, this URL here, URI doesn't refer to an actual document. Now a schema is where these, tags are defined at. So sometimes you want to tell it where your schema is located at. And you can do that by using the, the XML schema instance namespace. And so we have to reference that namespace. Let me say XML namespace. And by convention, you call it the XSI for XML schema instance equals, let's see what's in that list there. I'll just type it out www.w3.org slash 2001 XML schema instance. Okay. So this should always, well, like I said, it's by convention at XSI, but it doesn't have to be XSI. It can be anything. Wow. My mouse is being really freaky. I'm not sure it's up that. Then once we've done that, then we can use when we're referencing this schema. Now this, or this namespace, one of the things that namespace defines is a schema XSI schema location. So to see this recognizes that namespace, so I typed it right, and it recognizes schema location attribute. And so the schema location attribute is where I can specify the location of the schema. Now, if I want to specify the location of this schema document, or the names, the schema for this namespace, then I would come here and I would copy the schema name, and then I would provide a location for that. Usually you do it like this and put it on a separate line, and we'll say schema. Oh, 404 not found. So it says, I can't find that. So this should specify an actual document. In this case, it doesn't. This is just an example. So now I've provided a location for the schema and, or a uh, schema location for this namespace. And I can do the same thing for the code rage namespace, which this one will give me the 404 as well, because it doesn't exist. Schema.xsd. Okay. And boop, there it is underlined saying it wasn't there. Now before it was red, because I, when I just had the one there, it was red because you have to have the namespace URI and then the URI of the location of the schema document. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So this is a list that lists namespaces, schema documents, namespace, schema document. Okay, um, a couple other things here is you can have a default namespace, XML in S. If I do not provide a prefix and just, um, oops, HTTP, B. For example, that'd be a default namespace. You can also, and so that means any nodes that do not have a namespace applied to them, which would be this attribute here doesn't have a namespace applied to it. And this element, the root element doesn't have a namespace applied to it. Automatically become part of this namespace in Barcadero, which I guess we call it namespace. Okay. Which doesn't have to be, it can be anything in here. Um, but different parsers, typically this is a URI, but like I said, it doesn't, 
refer to a specific document. It doesn't refer to a specific domain. It doesn't actually go out and visit that site for the namespace. It does for the schema document here. So this should exist. This one doesn't need to exist. So there's a default namespace. And then you can also, it doesn't really make sense to have a default namespace and this one here, which is the XSI no, oops, no name space schema location. No namespace schema location. Okay, and then this one would refer to a, a location. So this time I'm gonna use a file. And this file doesn't exist either, but that's okay. XML. Okay, so now I'm referring to a local file here, and it's going to underline and say, whoa, that doesn't exist. Wow, this is really bizarre. My mouse is holding perfectly still, and now it's just totally freaking out. Okay, so that's the namespaces and schema locations works. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. You'll you'll probably see these a lot where you see these prefixes, and that's what that is, is this prefix. It means that it, this element belongs to this namespace and that namespace is defined by this schema document okay so there is namespaces and schemas i'm gonna try rebooting or stepping on my mouse or something to see if i can get to quit doing that so this is a little simple xml file here that it's based on david horton's recipe book xml you can read more about it here so you see we have a cookbook with a section with a recipe and inside that recipe we have recipe info ingredient list and preparation okay so if i edit this in here now and you probably saw this before it comes up with a little the code insight window that gives me the suggested tags and you notice the only options it has here is comment see data and question so these are not doesn't do me really any good for editing this particular document so let's say you're working with a lot of xml and you want to have this code insight built into your XML. So I'll show you how to do that. So you see I have this saved here. So I'm just going to go to the folder this is in. And here it is. I'm going to use a tool called XSD. And that XSD is comes with um, the platform SDK. And I'll show you where the, to uh, find that. You have to add it to your path. So I'm going to go XSD. And I'm going to say recipe. I'm going to generate a class, and I'm going to tell it, or no, that's not generate a class. Just did XML. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so the output file it created was recipe.xsd. And here it is. This is the XSD file. So another way you can do this without using the command line tool is you can actually come here also and say uh, create schema. And this created uh, XSD. This is almost exactly the same XSD, but it just created an ID. And it also automatically associated here that, so it's, it has it in the temp folder, so I'll go ahead and save this now in that folder. I'll just overwrite the other one, replace it, yes. And now it says recipe XSD. You can actually have multiples listed here if you need to have multiple XSDs to define it because they're coming from different namespaces. But now the interesting thing is, is when I come in here and I start writing a tag, it says, hey, a recipe info makes sense. So if I add a recipe info here, now you'll notice I get this squiggly underline. It says, first of all, this one's incomplete. But secondly, I can't have two of these. It says, the next thing it's expecting is an ingredient list, which is here. So this makes it really, in, really useful when you're editing XML in the IDE. So let's say I want to add a second recipe to this. Come up here. It doesn't give me an option to add another recipe here. And if I put one in manually, or you see IPE, it says, whoa, invalid child element recipe. Okay, it doesn't allow for multiple recipes. Now, if I come into this XSD here and find element name recipe, I can add max occurs is unbound. And what I've done is I've said, if I if this if max occurs isn't here, then there's only one is allowed. But I've said the maximum occurs is unbound, which means there can be as many instances of recipe as I want. Now, if I only wanted to say there could only be two instances of recipe, I could do that. Okay, so I'm going to say unbound. 
while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple other things about this. Um, so here on Blurb and Author, which are up here, Blurb, Author, you can, it has a type specified. Now down here on Quantity, the Quantity is an unsigned byte. Okay, so this actually restricts what type of information can be put in there in those different places. So that's really useful. Um, there's more information on this in the W3 uh, schema documentation. There's the namespace for it. I'll show you where to get to that later. Okay, so now if I come in here, I'll go ahead and delete this. Recipe. So see, now it says, oh, you want to have another recipe? That's the only thing that's allowed here. So now I can say, yes, I want another recipe. And it says, this is incomplete. Attribute title is missing. Oh, okay. Look, title. Another recipe. Okay. And it still says it's incomplete. A uh, list of possible expected element recipe info. So I do here, here, here is a P info. And you know what? I don't really want to put recipe info on this one. So let's go here and we'll find recipe info and we'll say min or curs. Zero. Someone said the minimum times it needs to occur is zero. And so now you'll notice that I have an option of ingredient list or recipe info. So a recipe info is optional now, so I can choose ingredient list. And add some ingredients in here, ingredient. And the first thing ingredient has is a quantity. And we'll say the quantity is one. And unit, we'll say box. And I guess I can put, oh, this is the way this works. Food item, and we'll say one box of awesome. Now, we'll see here, we have, it's invalid because it needs to be an unsigned byte. Remember I showed you that earlier. So it's checking to make sure that is an unsigned byte, and now it works just fine. So that's how we had an ingredient list, and of course we need a preparation here as well. Preparation. Step open box. So now we have two recipes on oh, either serving and notes. So we'll make notes option. Actually, we'll make both of those optional. Serving. So we'll say min occurs zero. Min occurs zero. Okay. So now this is all valid. So let's say we added something here that wasn't, um, that was extra. Can't put an exclamation mark in there. So I'm going to show you this XML XSD validator. It's based on some code I wrote previously. What it does is it actually uses the XSD to validate your XML file. I did put this back here where it's the uh, invalid type, and this one here is a tag that's not, an uh, element that's not supported. The application itself, all it does is passes in the two, the XML file and the XSD file. Then in here, this is the reusable class that I'll make this code available. You can use, it checks to make sure the XML file and the XSD file exists. If they do exist, then it goes ahead and it creates a stream reader to read an XSD file. And then it creates an XML schema object and then reads it in from the XSD reader. Okay, and it puts in a validation event handler. So this is going to validate the uh, XSD. And then here we're going to create an XML reader, um, reader settings, and we add the schema to this. Now, if you have an XML file that has multiple schemas, you could modify this class to have each individual schema added to your XML file, your reader settings. Okay, because this is your XML reader. And then we add a validation event handler onto that to validate the, as a validation occurs, it fi fires as event handler, okay? Then we create an XML reader and read in that, point it to that file name. And we attach the reader settings, which we created here, okay? And all this does is it spins through and reads that whole XML file. And then on those two event handlers, it adds 
an error to the errors list. And if the errors list is zero, then it returns true. If it's less than zero or more greater than zero, it returns false. Well, if it's less than zero, but that should never happen. That's all this does here. It's pretty simple, straightforward. I'll go ahead and run this and you can see what it does here. So we got an error, quantity element is invalid. The value one is invalid according to its data type. XML error, the element recipe has invalid child element extra. So this is the same information we saw from the IDE, but this is a, a nice programmatic way of doing that. So the cool thing about this is that if you have a system that is going to do some deserialization of an XML file, which I'll show you here next, then you can have this run ahead of time and get, tell you if you're going to be able to successfully deserialize that. Now, it's going to be, this is going to get you 90% because sometimes things happen in deserialization that you can't catch in XML schema validation, but this is going to get most of the stuff. Anyway, you can then provide this uh, report ahead of time and give it back to whoever provides you the XML file and say, hey, your XML is invalid. This is what's wrong. You need to fix it. Or if you're the person that has to fix it, then you know exactly what you need to go through and fix it. And it gives you all of the list or most all of them at once so you can go through and fix them all. But anyway, that's a great useful tool for validating your XML before you try and process it. Deserialization is a mechanism where you take an XML file and convert it into a collection of objects memory. In order to do that, the easiest way I found is to use the XSD tool again. I said I'd tell you where it was located at. It's in, this is the default location it gets installed into, program files, Microsoft SDK, SDKs, Windows. If you're using a different version of .NET, it could be something besides that, bin, and here is xsd.exe. So just add this path to your path. That's the easiest way to work with this. For, I don't know why it doesn't get added to your path by default when you install it, but it should be. So from here, I'm going to do xsd, and I'm going to call it on the xsd file this time. Because remember last time I ran it on the XML file, and it generated the xsd file. So I'm going to say recipe sd, and I'm going to say I want to create a class wrapper from this, and I want to use the language. Of course, the language that powers Embarcadero Prism is oxygen. And run this. And it output recipe.pass. So if I do directory, you see there's recipe.pass. So now in order to use this with our deserialization project, I have to add it in here. So I just say add existing item. And here it is, c backslash dev recipe.pass. Now if I just hit add here, it's going to actually copy the file into this project directory. But I don't want to do that because I want to be able to use this same file from different places. Plus, if I regenerate the recipe.pass file, I want the regenerated ones to be used. So instead, I'm going to say add as link. So you'll notice here it put the relative path in here. In this way, it's using the file in the other location. The code here is really simple. I'm going to start with this deserialized cookbook method, which returns a cookbook object. Now, the cookbook object is declared in here. So this is the auto-generated file by XS, the XSD tool. And you notice the first class in here is a cookbook. And the cookbook contains section, which is a cookbook section, which is defined here, so on and so forth. So each section of the XML is defined in here. So if it contains other items and it's a class, um, we get down here far enough. So here's the, for example, here's the title. The title is just a string, et cetera. Recipe array of cookbook section recipe. So in here, we create the serializer object and we tell it we want a serialized object for working with the type of cookbook. And then we just use a file stream to open the file name that we passed in, XML reader, created with the file stream. And then we call the serializer deserialize and pass in the reader. So the reader is going to read an XML, pass it into the deserializer, which is going to deserialize it back into an object, and then we cast that object as a cookbook and return the result set. And when we're done, we close the file stream. So we get that cookbook object back here. We store it in a CB instance, which is we're using the uh, type inference here. So it's going to create a variable, local variable type cookbook for us because that's the return type of deserialized cookbook. And we're going to spin through each recipe in cookbook section recipe and then each ingredient in that recipe, ingredient list. Okay, so we'll run this, and it's gonna create our shopping list for us to go out and buy the stuff we need to create a recipe. Create all the recipes in our cookbook. So we need peanut butter, celery, raisins, and awesome. 
Now, of course, we could expand this to instead of just printing the food item, we could also have it print the amount, etc. Lots more we could do with that. So, of course, the opposite of deserialization is serialization. So this project here does a serialization of the same recipe class. So you notice I added a link to the same recipe.pass file. And in here, I create a cookbook, and then I serialize the cookbook, and I save it to new recipe.xml. So creating the cookbook here, all the objects were defined in this file here. And so if you're not sure how to use something, you just scroll through it and find it. Or the IntelliSense obviously will work for you as well. So I'm creating here a cookbook, then I create a section, which is a cookbook section, and I'm using the extended constructor here to pass in the title during the construction. So this is a property on section is title, and I'm just saying set the title equal to this, and that way they will do this all in one line. Do the same thing on recipe, creating cold cereal, and then we add the recipe to the section's recipe array, We're actually just creating a whole array containing just the recipe. And then the recipe has an ingredient list, which is an array of cookbook section recipe ingredient. So I've done is I've just created an array here, and then I'm creating the individual object, cookbook section recipe ingredient, and using extended constructors to say we want one XML file, we want one XSD from the X SDK, and we want one oxygen compiler. And then we do the same thing here for the preparation of the recipe, which is an array of steps. We're going to generate the XSD, same steps we've done here. The result is the cookbook, which we return. And then we call serialize cookbook, passing in the cookbook object we created and the new recipe.xml. Now, one note about creating serializing objects is in this case, I'm serializing these objects that are generated from the XSD tool, which are based on the XSD, which is based on the XML. You can serialize any object you want, really. Um, of course, then. It's not going to be based on a specific XSD, but any collection of objects you have in memory, you can serialize out using this technique. So you just create the collection of objects and then serialize them out like this. So I'm creating an XML serializer type of cookbook. Okay, so cookbook is our type that's defined in here. File stream to write, and then we're going to use an XML writer, Unicode encoding, and then we just call serializer, passing in the writer, and the cookbook object that was passed in here. And that's it. It's going to write out the XML file. So we'll go ahead and run this. Serialize and select is our default project. We'll go ahead and run it. And there is no UI on this one. So it just runs and it's done. And if we pop out here to our folder, we see we have our new recipe.xml, which I'll go ahead and open up in here. And if we go to edit somewhere, it's advanced format document. There we go. So here's our new serialized recipes, cold cereal, and it added in the file of XML. So the you, it's a little bit different order here. One file of should be here. That's okay. As far as XML goes, it's still valid XML. One SDK of XSD EXE, one compiler of oxygen, and there's the steps. So this has generated this. Now, of course, the ultimate test is go back to our validator tool and set this as our default or start project. And instead of recipe.xml, we're going to validate new recipe.xml. And we run it. And it's all good, no errors. A little side note about the utility of generated XSDs. Most likely out in the somewhere where this XML is coming from, there's an XSD document that defines the XML document that you're receiving. So the process I've showed you is we get the XML document and then we generate an XSD from that document and optionally a Pascal file. That works great for that one XML file. The issue occurs when a new XML file comes that's generated from that same XSD. When we try and use the previously generated Pascal file against it, it may fail because the XSD we generated and the Pascal file we generated was for a subset of the actual XSD. So for example, I showed you earlier with, we had one recipe, we generated the XSD for it, but we actually, the original XSD could have supported multiple recipes, which we then modified that to have support for multiple X, multiple recipes. So the correct way of doing this is to actually get a copy of the original XSD. If you can't do that, then you have to 
keep regenerating that and that would be a good up reason to use that validation ahead of time to find out if you've received an XML document that in fact breaks your deserialization process so you can then regenerate it. To show off XPath, I created a little reusable tool here. It's not really probably incredibly useful, but it might be fun to play with when you're experimenting with XPath. Go ahead and run it. I'm going to load up this books.xml, which is a XML example provided by Microsoft. And you see it's just a list of books with titles, authors, and prices. Okay. So XPath, one thing about this is you'll notice down here this author is just Plato, where the rest of them have first name and last name. XPath is good when you're dealing with XML that maybe isn't real consistent throughout, or at least that's been my experience when I like to use XPath. So this here's a list of sample uh, XPath queries you can run, and you just select one. This one here is going to get a sum of the book price divided by the count of the number of books with prices. Okay, really simple. I just hit evaluate, and it gives us the result right here is 15.24. If I come back in here and change this book here, make it 18.99, and run this again, we'll see we get a different price, 17.74. So that's pretty useful here. And I'll go back and change this price back to 8.99, and we'll do this one here. And this one's going to do a selection. It's going to select the nodes, the book title, where the price is $10. And so this is saying, drilling into bookstore, book title. So we see here, bookstore, book title, where it has a child node. Well, I guess not child node, but a sibling node called price. So see, title has a sibling node called price. So it goes up to book to price to get to that. Okay, so I run this, and we see we have two of them here where the price is greater than 10. We have the Confidence Man and Oxygen Unleashed. Uh, this one here is going to select all the authors. Benjamin Franklin, Herman Melville, and Plato. Plato. Now, if we go back here and look at the XML, we see this has Benjamin Franklin, first name, last name. Plato, however, it just has a name. So if we look at the result, it's concatenated the first name and last name together, but it doesn't care that they're in different formats there. So this is where XPath comes in really useful for this different forms of XML. So here's the code behind the scenes when it's running. The This is the bulk of the code right here. We just load the uh, text from that into a stream, string reader, into the XML text reader. So you could instead just load the straight from a file and then we'll put that into an XPath document. And then we call the XPath document to create a new navigator. And we use the navigator to evaluate. This is the XPath statement that we had. And we turn the result to a string. Now I just check to see if the string is this, then instead of actually doing an evaluation that evaluates to a single value, we've actually got a selector. And so if that's the case, then instead of using the evaluate, I call the nav.select on the same statement and then create a string builder and I just move through all of the items that came up and output them to text. And so that's the output you see there. So really all you need to do is if you want to do an evaluation, it's three, three, these three lines, and if you're wanting to select a specific node, then you would go with this line instead of this line. And then the great thing about XPath is in that you can actually use this to, to navigate through it. So you can select a node or select a set of nodes and then evaluate those nodes or run an evaluation on those nodes or maybe run a selection from those nodes to get to other nodes and drill in further. So XPath is a great way to kind of navigate through an XML document and find just exactly what you're working to work with. So this is an example of using the link to XML to write an XML document. Now there's actually two different things I'm showing you here. So this is the uses that you need to use. You need to use link, uh, link and XML and XML link. So I have a collection here of, or an array of this object, the HTML color. I'm using the extended constructor syntax here to set the properties on that automatically. But then you'll see here, I'm using the X element. I'm just creating a, um, some nodes here showing you how you create an element and put an attribute on it using just the X elements. And so down here is where I'm actually using the link to XML. So from here, I'm saying from C in colors. So colors is my array of color objects. So I'm going to create the C object 
or have a reference to the C object for each color in this array. And I'm going to say select new X element color. So this is going to create a new element called color that's going to belong to this color's element here and assign two attributes, a name and a hex attribute. And then the values of those attributes are name and hex from the color. So this is a way that you can just spin through your object collection and create XML from it. So I'll run this. And you see here it is the XML is creating up at the top. And then this, of course, is the link to, we're using the link to generate the collection here. So I'm also have an example here of using the link to XML to read a document. And so this, I'm loading up the books document here, and I'm going to go through and say B or from B in all of the XML descendants. So it's going to go through and find all the book elements in the XML document that they're descendants from the root node. And we're going to cast the price of the book to a double. So we can do a comparison to see if it's less than 10, less than $10. If you used integer here, for example, then we give you an error saying the string is not formed correctly because you can't cast a string with a dot period in it to a dot integer. You have to cast that to a double. Um, so th that's be aware of that. If you're trying to cast it wrong, that you'll get that kind of error message. Or if you don't cast it right, then you can't compare a new number to a string. Okay. Then we're going to select B from B. We're going to get the titles value and say it's by author. And I'm using the oxygen's colon or colon operator here. And this operator says that if the author is missing, then instead of giving me a null reference exception, just return null for value. So I'm going to go ahead and run this here. And we see we have autobiographies of Benjamin Franklin by Benjamin Franklin and by Plato here, the Gore, Gore Gaius. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but I'm going to reverse this here now. And now we'll see. Oxygen Unleashed, which has a price greater than 10, but no name. And so that one shows up without, there's a null here that we don't see. Now, if I switch this back to the regular normal period, then we see we get a null reference exception. So, and it stopped ranking. So we'll just close that. So that's why you want to use the colon operator in here. This is huge when you're working with link like this, because especially XML, because you don't know, you might have some malformed XML. Of course, the secret to that is run it through validation with an XSD first to know that it's not malformed. But just in case, this is really good. Otherwise, if you were using another language like C Sharp or VB, you would have to have lots of code in here to check to make sure that it has values and stuff like that, which is a real big pain. So that's using link to XML to read an XML document. That has been Advanced XML with Oxygen and I guess, of course, the .NET framework. If you'd like more information on the Oxygen language, you can check out oxygenlanguage.com or the wiki, which is wiki.oxygenlanguage.com. Also, we have some videos available covering different features of Oxygen, which are available at rimobjects.com slash TV slash Oxygen. There's my email address there, jim at rimobjects.com. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter.